Manette inquired as to whether AJ was a mummy for Halloween. Defendant Cunningham indicated that he was not dressed as a mummy, rather those bandages were applied after AJ, quote, accidentally spilled boiling water all over himself. Thank you. On Halloween in 2017, AJ and defendant friend arrived at his home while trick-or-treating. He observed AJ to have a number of bandages on various parts of his body. Defendant friend explained to Rossau that the injuries were caused by AJ having spilled boiling water on himself on her visits to BCU. On the first occasion, Lamberti noticed that AJ had an, ex had an extremely dark black eye and bruises on his necks and arms. Upon Lamberti inquiring as to the cause of these injuries, Cunningham stated that AJ had, quote, accidentally fallen down the stairs. On the second occasion, approximately three weeks after the first, Lamberti observed that AJ had a cut and black and blue bruises on his arms and face. Cunningham, Cunningham explained to Lamberti that AJ had entered their basement and hit himself with power tools. On the third occasion, Lamberti observed AJ to have bruising to his face. Cunningham did not offer an explanation as to the cause of these injuries. At the end of March or early April 2019, defendant friend had brought AJ to work. Barfus observed that AJ had significant bruising and cuts on his forehead and the side of his face. A after inquiring as to the cause of these injuries, defendant friend replied that AJ had, quote, fell down the stairs. 2019, Crabtree observed AJ to have injuries to his face on two occasions. On the first occasion, defendant Cunningham claimed that AJ was burned by a pot of water. On the second occasion, de defendant Cunningham stated that AJ had fallen down the stairs while sleepwalking. Judge, at this time, we seek to enter People's Exhibit 1. What, if anything, did you observe about the condition of the residence? Um, it was not good. Um, there was parts of the ceiling were missing and um, there was a big hole in the ceiling. Um, the floor had been destroyed, the tile of, or linoleum had been up, it was raw wood. Um, the door um, area was black with dirt and feces, it smelled horrific. Um, that was just the main entry. Um, as we continued through the house, um, the living room area had bags and bags of clothes um, and piles of clothes strewn about. Um, we then went upstairs, um, checked AJ's room, um, the window was open. I thought odd because it was cold. Um, it, it smelled of dirty diapers. There were stacks of dirty diapers um, on the floor and over, overflowing, um, and there was a, a nasty stench. Um, and, and then I think that was all the rooms that I had checked at that point. While you make any observations about AJ, I did. So what did you observe? Back into the kitchen, um, AJ had walked into um, where I was standing. There's a kitchen island in the kitchen, and he'd come from like the living room area. And as he came through, I noticed a large bruise on his side. Okay, when you are talking about his side, where specifically did you notice that bruise? It's on his right, like right above his hip area, um, right side, hip area, kind of all that whole space there. Lower, lower. I asked AJ, um, with Joanne present, I asked AJ um, what had happened, where did he get the bruise? Okay, what did AJ say? At that point he paused and Joanne leaned down and in his ear she said to him, Lucy the dog did that to you, right? And then he said, yes, the dog did that to me. When they came back to the station, did you have the opportunity to interact with AJ? I did. Can you describe for the court what AJ was like? Um, he was just a happy kid. Um, they were hungry, so we'd gone and gotten the McDonald's for both PF and AJ. Um, Run around playing with the toys, coloring. Um, AJ was taking care of Parker, um, making sure he had enough juice. He would refill his cup for him, um, making sure he had juice. And we just kind of ran around and played and played dinosaurs and it was just being a kid. Was AJ well behaved? Yes, ma'am. Did he listen to you? Yes, yes, ma'am. And when you spoke with AJ in that separate room, was anybody else present for the conversation? No. What, if anything, did AJ tell you about the bruising? I tried to ask open-ended questions. Um, so I started by asking him uh, what, if he had been spanked or hit. He said yes. Um, I asked him with what, and he said a belt. I asked, him, I asked him who did it, and he said, someone not in my family, and then he offered that maybe mom didn't mean to hurt me. Okay, was that the only thing AJ said about the bruise? Well, yeah, and then, and then at that time, he got quiet again, um, was not very conversational, and went back to the story about the dog. And at that point, I stopped asking questions. Why did you stop asking questions? I was afraid. I had. I know that I. I had. I knew that I got important information at that point that I don't think DCFS had gotten, 
and that at this point um, he it, it might behoove us to have him answer questions um, with a trained examiner or with a couple other people in the room just because it was going to be an important piece of the investigation. Okay. And after speaking with the parents, um, what did you do? We uh, asked the parents for a consent to search the house extensively to make sure AJ had not been overlooked or was hiding or any uh, you know circumstances. All right, that. and so just, just generally after going into the house, uh, what was your impressions? What were some of your impressions of, of the home and the interior of the home, please? My initial entry on the side door, which is the main point of entry, I had sensory overload. Kitchen is the main point. When you walk into the kitchen, the subfloor is exposed. There was no room on the counters for anything at all. There was a ceiling that had a hole in it, had some water damage. Basically, more or less just filth is how I viewed it as. What did it smell like? A stale smell, food that had been left out. Did you, did you smell anything? Did, was there the smell of urine? A faint smell, more or less of a stale, musty smell in the kitchen area upon entry. You're, I was more or less sensory overloaded when you first walked in. It was just so much to take in at once. I was not expecting to see that when you first walk in for a missing child report. Okay. Based on your training experience, you recognize what those are? Yes. Okay, what are they? Those spent uh, used syringes. And could those be used for heroin injection? Yes. All right, and did you find That's their dining room. It's more towards the front of the house, big enough for a dining room table, more or less, from front to back. Okay. This is what? All just piles of clutter and garbage and debris. They had stored down there. So we had to search through all that initially because due to AJ, of course, being an, you know, a small child, we had to really dig in there for things, just garbage. D22, what are we looking at here? Same thing, there's a, a fly tape on the wall, a little mattress, and just tons of just garbage, just really more or less just random things of just storage, I guess. Okay, thank you. What is this? This is the outside to uh, AJ's room. Okay, and D28? What That's a, a chain lock with a padlock attached to the outside of the door frame that would prevent him from exiting the door, the room. E29, is that the slide as well as the chain lock? Correct. Outside of AJ's room? Yes. 35, what's this? That's also, they had a padlock, combination lock on his, on his closet and bedroom. Okay, so there's a padlock on his closet. Is the padlock on the inside or outside of the door? That's on the outside. So you lock somebody in from the outside? Yeah, that's my, my perception of it myself. Objection. Dr. Wittick, I'm showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit E1. Would you tell the judge what we're looking at here? This is, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, the little boy was in a body bag and then wrapped in what looked like plastic bags. Um, so that's A.J. Freund. Um, inside all those gray wrappings. Thank you. Show me what's been marked as exhibit E2. Doctor, what are we looking at here? This is his face um, from a full review. All right, and doctor, using this, you got a laser pointer right here. Wait, two and one. Wait. That's the top one, right? Top one, yep. Okay. All right, using diagram 21 uh, to the front of AJ's face, could you just describe the injuries that you observed? Um, on the front of the face here, um, there's a number of abrasions up here, some of which are, um, there are multiple small circular abrasions. Some of them are irregular. All right, and prior to coming here to court, doctor, did you have the opportunity to review pictures of the shower head that was found on the second floor of 94 Dole Avenue? Yes, sir. All right, and how do those compare to the abrasions that you saw? On the, on the forehead of A.J. Friend's remains? The multiple circular red abrasions here on the central forehead match the shower head that I was shown. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Doctor, the, but the, I, I guess I don't understand. The, is it the point of the skull to protect from blunt force trauma? So if the skull is absorbing many of the blows to the exterior, how is it that his brain is swelling? Well, keep in mind that right now, if your brain is not swollen at all, 
um, you have a space between your brain and your skull. Okay. And in between that space, stuck to the skull, is the dura or dura mater, which is a uh, fibrous covering that helps also protect the brain. But when the brain is struck or, for example, when somebody um, falls off a couple story building and hits their head, the brain moves around inside the skull and can um, hit the inside of the skull. And then as the brain swells, um, the whole surface of the brain flattens out, which is what we saw here. And um, the brain starts to, well, crush itself against the skull. Does that affect breathing? Uh, it will affect breathing, everything basically in terms of your internal functions. So, 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 so I guess would you describe the process of death for the judge? Well, basically he's received multiple injuries to his head. His brain is swelling. He's inhaling blood. His brain is swelling more. Now his brain is swollen so much that it's actually starting to crush itself against the skull because it has no place to go. And because it's crushing itself inside, um, well, the vital breathing, heart, all the different organs slowly but surely shut down. And then death occurs. Would this have been a painful death? Um, when he was actually being injured, yes. Um, once he's unconscious, of course, no. Okay. And then in terms of the extent of the blood, blunt force trauma, how does this compare to other cases of child abuse that you've seen? Uh, it's a pretty bad case.